Okay, so let's come back to chromium. Let's talk a little bit about some of the symptoms of chromium deficiency. Again, what, is its, what are its primary roles? The primary role is in blood sugar regulation, which means it helps us to make energy, right? We can't get glucose into the cell. We convert that to fat. We end up struggling with weight gain. We end up struggling with adequate energy. So fatigue is a very, very common symptom of chromium deficiency. So if you're tired all the time, you know, you might think chromium. Obesity, if you're gaining weight, especially those of you who have like unexplainable weight gain, you're eating the same amount of calories um, and you're still gaining weight, same amount of calories that you always have eaten, this could be symptoms of chromium deficiency. Now, another one that's not on this list, and I'm going to add it here, is sugar craving and mood swings. Irritability, what is the same thing that happens when somebody's hypoglycemic, when their blood sugars are going up and down. Um, they, get, they crave sugar and they have agitation, irritability, and mood swings. So these are things to look out for. If you're not typically a sugar craver, you're not typically a person that considers yourself irritable and goes ups and downs with blood sugar, if this starts to happen during, again, during this time, you might think chromium. High blood sugar is a side effect of elevated chromium, and I have actually seen cases where people develop diabetes as a result of chromium deficiency. Like they weren't, over, they weren't necessarily overweight people, they weren't doing things terribly wrong in their diet. They just were so deficient in chromium that their body lost the ability to regulate blood sugar through that insulin receptor activity that I showed you a moment ago. So high blood sugar can lead to diabetes, and this can be a symptom of chromium deficiency. It can also elevate blood pressure. Remember, high blood sugar thickens the blood. It increases the viscosity of the blood, puts more pressure on the heart as a pump to pump that fluid through your body, and that can increase the pressure, the arterial pressure. Insulin resistance. So as I said a minute ago, high blood sugar diabetes, well, prediabetes is insulin resistance. This is you know what happens a lot in this scenario that we call uh, metabolic syndrome right, which doctors are now, you know, using this word um, more frequently because it's, it's a major problem in the U.S. and in most industrialized countries where people develop obesity, central adiposity, they develop high blood pressure and blood sugar problems all kind of simultaneously. So metabolic syndrome falls into that. Type 2 diabetes is kind of just the progression from insulin resistance. And then that can lead to heart disease. Why? Be again, when you have increases in blood sugar, what does blood sugar do? Blood sugar glycates. It makes everything in the bloodstream sticky, it makes your hormones less work, effect work less effectively, but it also, in a sense, damages your hormones. So you, you have less effect, effect in, your, in your hormone control, you have less effect in the proteins that circulate through your bloodstream to deliver nutrients. This can also lead to, when the fat goes up, can lead to true high cholesterol. When I say true high cholesterol, I'm not talking about what the pharmacy companies have done over the last you know, 20 years or so by artificially reducing the levels of, of cholesterol to sell more of their statin medications, uh, because that's what's happened. You know, When I started practice years ago, normal cholesterol was 280. A lot of people don't realize that, but the pharmacy companies influenced um, influence the numbers down to 250, then to 220, then to 200. And now anybody with cholesterol that's 201, they're being told by their doctor, get on statins. When the, you know, the actual, I would call this more of a norm than I would call any of these other numbers. But, um, but again, true high cholesterol, when it gets up over that 280 mark and, and beyond, that can happen with a chromium deficiency. And then neuropathy, and this has to do with the blood sugar problems because when blood sugar stays elevated enough, it can actually create nerve damage, to, especially in the hands and the feet. So if you've heard of diabetic neuropathy, chromium deficiency over long periods of time contributes to that nerve damage because of the blood sugar elevation. So this is, a, again, one of those symptoms to look out for. And then PCOS. A lot of people don't realize this, but PCOS itself is diabetes of the ovaries. So the way I want you, polycystic ovarian syndrome, right? Diabetes of the ovaries. Is, this is why doctors use a diabetes medication to treat PCOS. They use actually metformin is the most common, uh, commonly prescribed treatment for PCOS and as well for diabetes. And, and it's because metformin improves insulin sensitivity. Uh, and helps to reduce insulin resistance. It does so chemically 
without actually doing anything about chromium. So again, if you've got a diagnosis of any of these problems and your doctor's never asked you about chromium or never measured your chromium or never even looked or thought to think about chromium, your job now is to engage that doctor in this conversation. Osteoporosis, again, we said earlier that, that it helps to regulate calcium and hydroxyproline and, and so bone density, play, chromium plays a major role there as well. So how do we get more chromium in our diet just through natural means, right? Without supplementation, one of the best ways to get chromium is, and we, these are grain-free, of course, grain-free food sources, broccoli, tomatoes, romaine lettuce, black pepper, green beans, brewer's yeast. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not a huge fan of brewer's yeast, but it does contain B vitamins, and many of you that are vegetarian use brewer's yeast as a source of B vitamins, so uh, it's also a source of chromium. And then we get down here, a couple of these, if for those of you who may be following more of like a more of like a carnivore diet, the beef, the turkey, and then we have apples and bananas. So these are all decent dietary sources of chromium that you can add to your diet if you're not consuming them already to get more chromium uh, intake uh, through food as opposed to through supplementation. Now, as far as supplementation is concerned, you know the quantity of chromium and an adult can take relatively safe, right, without risk of major issues, is between two and 400 micrograms a day. Therapeutically, it's gonna be this higher number. If you're just talking about day-to-day -day supplementation, should be probably this or less, that 200 or less, but two to 400 micrograms of chromium per day is a good amount uh, if you're looking at trying to enhance through supplements, through supplementation. But again, my advice would be first to get tested. So get tested, and the best way to test chromium is not through the serum, it's what's called intracellular testing. So you look inside the cell, you make sure chromium is there in adequate quantities to do what we talked about earlier. Remember one of its main functions for blood sugar, it's to, through the DNA, you need that chromium inside the cell to regulate the, the, the genetic ability for you to produce that antenna that sits on the surface, that insulin receptor antenna that sits on the surface of the cell. So if you don't have chromium inside the cell, that's not gonna happen very well. And if your doctor's looking for chromium outside the cell and it looks normal, it doesn't mean that that chromium is getting inside the cell to do that job. So chromium, very, very important as it relates to blood sugar regulation in the holiday time for regulating a blood sugar. Hey, don't forget to check out the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below. And as always, thanks for tuning in.